The Order of Our Martyred Lady Story continued from Sisters of Battle and other entries The days have blown by since I stood on the trenches, leaving myself open for a hail of death I knew I could not stop. Since I was saved by the Emperor's own angels. Not his angels of death, not his Astartes, but the next best thing, his holy sisters. She had stood over me, shielded me with her own body, put my life before hers and suffered the arrows on my behalf. She saved me. But not just my body. She saved my very soul. If I had lost my faith, and she gave it back to me. With a vengeance. Vengeance, an appropriate word, for that is exactly what we took from the enemy from that day onwards. It turned out these things were not Xenos after all, but worse. They were debased and corrupted humans, filthy mutants, with what I now knew as wooden arrows and their packs like animals. At first, we had underestimated them. But then they pushed us back again and again, nearly wiped us out. But the sisters arrived, in their black power armour, with a holy bolter, flamer and faith alone, they led us back into the fight. Miracles were common now, things to be looked forward to, not just prayed for, and we saw so many. It turned out that this was once a human world, in the dark age of technology, 20,000 years ago or something. It was the centre of a star empire then. <laughs> or some snot told me it overheard while acting as a Sherpa for the tech boys. Or was it some academic of some form? I forget. But it panned out. For with the sisters in charge, leading the way, burning the enemies as they did, we moved like lightning across every continent of this whole world. We pushed the things back and took their places of power from them. Not only had they changed due to chemicals and age and war, but also due to being heretics. They had to be put to the sword, one and all. And with the sisters there, we went at it like hammer and tongs. It was as if the sisters' mere presence made us all froth at the mouth. We had such a fire in our belly. We were doing this for the Emperor. We could tell he was happy about it. Lights and birds and flames and flying priests are plenty. It was like being in the Great Crusade, some said. Like he was with us every step of the way. When we started bumping into things that were the size of land raiders, horns and screams and blue flames, he was with us. He shielded us from the flames whenever a sister led us in. He crushed them with his holy light when a sister pleaded for it. And he had empowered us, all of us, even me. I felt ecstasy when I witnessed the mass firing of the sisters' bolters, their massive organ guns atop transports, firing a missile at the enemy for every key struck, every cord rung. We burned them and slew them wherever we found them, and we made for their capital. A month ago, I would not have thought that these things were human, let alone base horrors of ones, but I certainly would not have thought that they were organised, or had a capital, a seat of power. But they did, and we crushed all around it before heading directly at that place. Usually, war dictates that we crush the capital, cut off the head first, then resistance usually crumbles. It's what we did in the last two worlds, but here, nah. We were not here to demoralise them, we were here to wipe them out. So if their capital until last. And the sisters shelled it remorselessly for days, all the while walking our lines and leading us in prayers, in psalms, in song, in glory to the Emperor. None slept, none of them faltered, none of them seemed to stop for basic sustenance. They didn't need to. Their faith fed them, 
Their faith kept them strong, kept them awake and kept them pure. We loved them for it. Knowing that it was truly the love of the Emperor, we felt really. But one can't help but thank the one who brings you the sustaining meal sometimes, despite that that thanks should be for the cook. <laughs> Am I right? Anyways. The last battle was bloody, as bloody as any bayonet work I've ever done. You may scoff, but most times you don't actually get to use them. If your guns don't take down a Xenos, nine times out of ten, a bayonet ain't gonna either. So if they hit your lines, it's over. But this time was different. We had the sisters with us. We had squads of them leading our companies in. I was in a mix and match outfit, of course. Nothing left of my original. But with them at the front, leading us on, inspiring us all, protecting us all. When the guns and missiles of the sisters went silent, we didn't hang about. It was double time over the defile, then straight into them. The sisters were things of wonder. I even had the fortune of my very own angel being in the squad that led us in. But it was hard fighting. Corridor fighting. The sisters could not be stopped. Their flamers and bolters tore the monsters to pieces. Me and the lads covering the side aisles had plenty to be doing as well. Previously, I'd have called this hell. Cold, dark, noise rebounding all around and deafening us all. The chaos of it. But now... I felt righteous. I was doing the Emperor's will. I was as close to heaven as I could get. As close perhaps as when I will sit at his very side. I was doing his work. We shot and burnt and bludgeoned and bayoneted our way down miles of corridors filled with these things. But this was it. This was the last of them. So every stab, slash or shot was just one more step towards their end. Their final destruction. We sang. We actually sang while we did it. But I won't try to replicate that now. No guns to drown me out. I sound like a grox that's been kicked in the privates. We all did. But the sweet song of the sisters, the bass of their bolters, the swing of their chainsaws, it made it holy. Continued at the end of the law. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and important forces of the Warhammer 40k universe. The grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. And today, we have to take a look at one of the subgroups of the Adepta Sororitas, the Order's Militant, the Order of Our Martyred Lady. The templates for the sisters, much as the Ultramarines are for the Adeptus Astartes, the Space Marines. They are the type of sister of battle you will most commonly see. But this is actually correct, as they are the most numerous and most active of all of the Order's militant. And so, as usual, for the very basics, let us lean on existing wisdom. To quote, The Order of Our Martyred Lady the fires of vengeance burn bright in every sister of the Order of Our Martyred Lady. They are the God Emperor's fiery sword, the deliverers of His holy justice, and to the sound of impassioned prayers, they rain unrelenting destruction upon His enemies. Of all of the Order's militant, there are none more numerous or more widely spread than the Order of Our Martyred Lady. Their name is known by the ruling elites and unwashed masses alike on countless worlds across the galaxy, and when spoken evokes hope in the righteous and fear amongst the faithless. The Order is renowned for its unrelenting pursuit of those who defy the Emperor by doing harm to his Imperium and its citizens. Xenos Marauders, Chaos Armies and heretical cults are met with burning fury by the Sisters of Our Martyred Lady, who gather wherever the enemy is found to scour them from existence. The Order of Our Martyred Lady was once called the Order of the Fiery Heart and was one of the original four orders militant. It was founded by Sebastian Thor's successor, Ecclesiarch Alexis XII, split the two great convents into subsidiary military forces 
with the Sisters of the Covenant Sanctorum divided into the Orders of the Valorous Heart and the Order of the Fiery Heart. The Order of the Fiery Heart was led by Catherine, Alicia Dominica's shield-bearer and one of the six matriarchs who had stood in the Emperor's presence in the chamber of the Golden Throne. Catherine had long been regarded as Dominica's second in command, and even before heading her own order, had led many successful campaigns against the forces of heresy and warpcraft. With the Sisters of the Fiery Heart behind her, Catherine engaged in ever more wars of faith, seeking out the enemy both within and beyond the borders of the Imperium, and casting upon them the immolating light of the Emperor. It was during one such war of faith that Catherine was slain. Records regarding the events of her martyrdom are sparse and at times contradictory, with the oldest and most reliable account appearing in a charred fragment of parchment known as the Candela Scroll. The legible script on this scroll states that Catherine's death came at the hands of the witch cult of Menestus, but there is no indication of what this cult was or how they managed to slay the revered warrior. Ecclesiarchal records do show that word of Catherine's demise sent waves of anguish throughout the Adept of Sororitas, with many orders holding weeks-long vigils. Yet the Order of the Fiery Heart took no such action. Every last preceptory, commandery and mission in the Order gird themselves for battle, and channeled their grief into an endless quest for retribution. In honour of their fallen matriarch, they became the Order of Our Martyred Lady and have continued to seek vengeance ever since. For millennia, the Sisters of the Order bore armor and weapons of stark black as a sign of their mourning. It was only after their engagements in the Third War of Armageddon that red was introduced into their livery. The Sisters of Our Martyred Lady continue to embody Catherine's burning passion and unflagging determination. On the battlefield, they employ tactics that see their formation spread like an unstoppable fire advancing inexorably as they reduce all who stand before them to ash. Yet their approach to warfare is far from undisciplined. Catherine was a devout student of, of military doctrine and combined the formidable fighting techniques developed by the daughters of the Emperor with those practiced by other branches of the Imperium. Her teachings have been upheld by the Order of Our Martyred Lady and its sisters are able to switch from one strategy to another with frightening speed and efficiency. Since the death of their matriarch, the Order of Our Martyred Lady have developed a cult of martyrdom that is unparalleled amongst the Sisterhood. All sororitas are taught that to die serving the Emperor is the purest fate his servants can hope for, but amongst the Sisters of Our Martyred Lady, this ideal is expressed so fervently that it can appear to the uninitiated as though they have a death wish. Isolated battle sisters stand bravely against onrushing hordes of foes, hymns of defiance and reports of bolt guns rising to a simultaneous crescendo. And when the blades of the foe hack into the sisters' flesh, they give their souls willingly to the God Emperor. Such noble deaths are met with shouts of praise from the slain sisters' comrades, for it is but such unwavering loyalty and boundless faith that the Emperor's gaze is drawn to the battlefield. In the name of these martyrs, those who remain achieved treats the defy explanation destroying foes of far greater numbers and transforming inevitable defeats into miraculous victories. It is not only the slain warriors of their order that the sisters of our martyred lady revere, it is all who have given their life to preserve the sanctity of the Imperium. The sisters look to the example of their matriarch, who as a shield-bearer placed the lives of others above her own and celebrate those warriors who embody the spirit of St. Catherine in their defense of mankind. Through battle psalms they give praise to the guardsmen, space marines and tech priests who have been slain fighting alongside them in the wars of faith. The bravest fallen soldiers are bestowed the same honor that the Order of Our Martyr Lady gives its own sisters. Their names are added to the Order's hymns of vengeance and are sung before combat to stoke the wrath of the Sororitas. The Order of Our Martyred Lady holds fortified sanctuaries on a great deal of imperial worlds, many of which date back to St. Catherine's Wars of Faith. Some of these sanctuaries operate in relative isolation, existing far beyond the established boundaries of the Order's parish, but the majority are located in the Segmentum Obscurus. The broad distribution of the Order's preceptories 
has seen the sisters of our martyr lady engage in many of the Imperium's most grueling war zones. On Armageddon, the sisters amassed to defend the Sanctorum of St. Catherine against the orc hordes of Gazgul Mag Urkthraka. Though fully half of their number were martyred, they inflicted such casualties on their enemies the vital greenskin forces were drawn away from other battles, the sheer grit of the sisters enticing orcs from far and wide to join the siege. The Order also fought on Cadia during the 13th Black Crusade of Abaddon the Despoiler. Though the planet eventually fell, the faith held by those who battled there led to a great miracle, with Saint Celestine appearing from the warp to bolster the defenders in their darkest hour. Although the Great Rift now divides many of the Order's sanctuaries, the Sisters of our Martyr Lady have not relented in their quest to avenge the Imperium's fallen heroes. They stand dauntless against the chaos forces that pour from newly opened warp storms, and they march out to annihilate any foe that would prey upon humanity's beleaguered defenders. The fire of their spirit is a beacon of hope, a sign that even in this time of abounding horror, the Emperor has not abandoned his faithful servants. Notable Sisters of the Order of Our Martyred Lady Palatine Ariel Palatine Ariel led her sisters through the Jericho Moor Warp Gate and into the fallen Jericho Reach at the behest of Cardinal Cal. However, shortly after arriving she had a dream. In it she saw flesh-masked demons cavorting atop fallen statues of the Emperor. Beyond them, a beam of light illuminated a tall mountain covered in interlocking aquilas. Beneath the mountain, a foul black cloud swirled. Even as she watched, the demonic hordes grew closer to the mountain, and she knew that if they were to discover the evil beneath, the consequences would be catastrophic. When Ariel awoke, she was convinced the Emperor had revealed her real duty. Following the Palatine's vision, her commandery braved the warp storms around Eleusius and found the mountain she had seen. No one knows precisely what the Order of Our Martyred Lady found on Mount Sifir, but they are singularly devoted to protecting it from the unfaithful. Ariel has sworn a vow to allow only the confirmed faithful of the God Emperor to pass through the gates of the Lethean Abbey, though her vision has made her suspicious of all who seek entrance. Since the construction of the defences around Mount Sif, Palatine Ariel has allowed no one to cross the threshold into the Abbey, not even the Cardinal himself. St. Praxides At the start of the Second Tyrannic War in 991 Millennium 41, Canoness Praxides reinforced the Caladinian Regiment of the Imperial Guard on Ocasus. She led the Imperial forces in defense of the Cardinal Palace and fought a gallant counterattack when the Tyranids reached the palace. She led from the front and managed to kill a hive tyrant, throwing the rest of the attack into disarray. This allowed many refugees to flee the planet and left Praxedes with her forces on the world. She proceeded to press deep into the heart of the Tyranid forces and led a guerrilla war against the Tyranids. The destruction she managed to cause meant that the attack on the spaceports by the Tyranids was nowhere near as effective as it should have been. This allowed the remaining civilians to flee the planet. All contact was lost with her forces once the last shuttle had taken off, and she became known as the first martyr to High Fleet Kraken. Her name is revered across the Ultima Segmentum, but some claim she fights on still against the hordes of the Tyranids from within. Muriel Sabathiel Muriel Sabathiel was a former Sister Superior of the Order of Our Martyred Lady, and is the only acknowledged battle sister to have willingly chosen to serve chaos in the history of the Imperium of Man. Karanes Olga Karamans tried to apprehend Miriel, proclaiming a desire to help her, but she was murdered by Miriel for her troubles. Miriel now serves as a servant to the pleasure god Slanesh, and is one of its finest and most prized chaos champions. Sister Piety Born on the world of Joe's descent, Sister Piety was an early convert to the Imperial Creed and as a young girl, recently graduated from the Scola Progenium, served the Ecclesiarch's mission throughout her home system. The mission's preacher took the pious girl under his wing and blessed her with a new, more befitting name. Eventually he sponsored her admission into the convent sanctorum, 
and Piety was proven a most devout daughter of the Emperor. Piety bears the heavy title of Ward Sentinel. Sister Piety's duties have made her a shrewd and insightful woman. While her faith in the God Emperor is unwavering, and she trusts Palatine Ariel implicitly, the Ward Sentinel does not disdain the help of the Ecclesiarchy or the Inquisition, as her Palatine does. In fact, Sister Piety has been in contact with Inquisitor Duchesne for several years, a fact she has not shared with Palatine Ariel. In the course of her duties as Ward Sentinel, Sister Piety has, has permission to leave the Lathean Abbey and is accounted amongst the shrines of Millian's Grace far more frequently than any other member of the Adeptus Sororitas. Petronella the Pious Petronella the Pious was a famed abbess of the Order of Our Martyred Lady, who was renowned for the miracles that occurred in her presence. Though the humble warrior never claimed to possess any unusual powers or worth, it seemed that the eye of the Emperor was ever upon her. Those who witnessed Petronella's abilities described her foes being consumed by holy fire, while the abbess's friends were spared from death by miraculous twists of good fortune. After the abbess's courageous martyrdom on Xiphil V, her skull was fashioned into a sacred totem by the ecclesiarchy, to which her blessings still cling. Sesti the Dawnbringer Sesti was a palatine of the order who was martyred during her service to the Emperor. She was known as the Champion of Mordian and the leader of the Dawn March. Gilith the Indomitable Gilith was a battle sister of the order who is presumed to have been martyred in the Emperor's service. She is remembered as a foe of the Dukari and the Breaker of Shackles. Ephrael Stern Known as the Thriceborn and the Demonifuge, Ephrael Stern had been promised by her parents during her birth to the Adeptus Sororitas. She was raised on the plant Antigone's Harbour by the St. Sabbat Scola Progenium. The Archdrill Abbot of the school submitted the young Ephrael for induction within the sisterhood and was accepted by Sister Patricia from the Order of the Holy Seal. The novice Stern excelled at her new monastic duties as a battle sister in training. She eventually completed her training, along with 500 other novices, took her sacred oaths of adherence at the Ecclesiarchal Palace on Terra. Sister Cern was then chosen to become a member of the Order of Our Martyred Lady. Shortly after her induction into the Order, she was sent to the Ecclesiarchy Cardinal World of Ophelia VII. While stationed there, her exemplary service record helped elevate her to the esteemed rank of the Order Seraphim within record time. Only three years later, she was ordained as a Sister Superior. Sister Stern was eventually sent on a mission on behalf of the Order to investigate a lost convent of Sisters of the Order Paratus on the world of Parnis. There, Stern discovered what had become of, of her fellow Sisters. A powerful greater demon of Slanesh, a keeper of secrets named Asteroth, had been freed from its bonds and destroyed the convent. He then took the ruined bodies of 700 battle sisters and forged them body and mind into a terrifying construction of living flesh known as the Screaming Cage. Though the fallen sisters were forced to share their torment and suffering, the demon failed to take into account that they were also able to inadvertently share their faith as well. As the demon sought to kill the remaining sisters sent to investigate the convent, a ferial stern fell in battle. Seizing this one chance, the fallen sisters within the screaming cage used their combined powers to bring her back to life, filling her with the full might of their combined faith in the god emperor to combat the forces of chaos. Once returned to life, the resurrected stone was told to flee as the fallen sisters hid her presence from the demon and its chaos servants. Stone's memory of these events was erased. She was the only one who managed to return to her order on Ophelia Seven being the sole survivor of the expedition to Parnas, her sanity stretched to the limit. Her seemingly unnatural power made her the subject of suspicion amongst the members of her order, with many of her sisters viewing her as having been corrupted by the ruinous powers. Stone was placed within a holding cell for four years, and her exact nature could be determined. At this time, she was attacked by a sister who was being controlled by a demon of Slanesh to silence her but the enraged Ephrael managed to defeat her attacker with her bare hands. This set new events into motion. An inquisitorial investigation under the command of Inquisitor Silas Hand 
was sent to the order of Ophelia VII to investigate the sole survivor of the Parnas expedition. Whilst at the Sanctorum, Stern underwent numerous trials to test her purity and her soul for corruption. Not found wanting during these trials, Sister Stern was declared uncorrupted and was reinstated within the ranks of her fellow battle sisters and granted her former position as Seraphim and rank of Sister Superior. Inquisitor Hand, not fully trusting Sister Stern, nevertheless took her with him to investigate the former convent on Parnas. During the investigation, the fallen sisters of the Screaming Cage finished their holy work, pouring all of their remaining knowledge and power into Sister Stern to fight the corruption of chaos. Inquisitor Hand sacrificed himself to defeat Astaroth and banish the demon back to the warp. Sister Stern went missing after this second expedition, once again being the sole survivor. Hunted by both the Imperium as well as the forces of chaos, Stern remains aloof from both. She even sacrificed herself, stabbing herself at the heart, to escape the foul machinations of the vile sorcerer Adaman of the Thousand Sons Traitor Legion. Resurrected once again by the power of the faith within her, Stan finally embraced her destiny and used it freely for the first time. She has even been able to use her newfound abilities to defeat a Calexus assassin that had been sent to kill her by the Inquisition. Her current whereabouts remain unknown. Miria Miria was a Celestian Elohim, equivalent to the rank of Sergeant, who was originally tasked with passing judgment upon a newly rediscovered world of Holos, which had been lost for two millennia, due to being cut off by a warp storm. During initial investigation, she uncovered that Holos was once a research colony that studied replicate technology, or cloning, and that replicas were utilized as soldiers to defend their world from incursions by the forces of chaos during the time Holos was cut off from the rest of the galaxy. But over time, the chemical process within their bodies that gave them red skin color and made them subservient dissipated until they developed free will. They rebuilt Holos to be a pacifist society, shunning their role as soldiers in which they had been designed and forced to fulfill. Initially, Miria was going to turn over all replicas to the Adeptus Mechanicus per Imperial decree, which stated replicae did not hold citizenship, therefore they had no civil rights. Not that there were a great deal anyway. But she also uncovered a plot by the human citizens of Holos who wished to overthrow the replicae. These revolutionaries proved to be a cult of Zinch, who ended up staging a revolt, declining to utilize orbital bombardment that would have seen the deaths of millions Miria instead ordered the Adeptus Mechanicus representative to release the chemical agent within the replicate's neural chemistry that would make them subservient and denied of free will once more. Unfortunately, this process would be irreversible. Once this process was complete, the replicate were ordered to stop the revolt and did so without hesitation, fighting alongside Miria and her fellow battle sisters. Following these events, Miria would later be assigned to bring the Psyker, Torres Vaughn, to justice. When he escaped her custody and murdered one of her comrades, Lathy, and tortured another, Iona, Miria pursued him to the world of Neva. There she and her remaining comrades discovered a greater plot threatening the entire Imperium, and ultimately saw Vaughn and his compatriot, Victor Lahain, defeated. Through interrogation, they learned of an even greater plot, that Vaughn was actually a product of experimentation on psychers. Miria, her assistant Verity, the battle sisters Cassandra and Isabel later uncovered and destroyed this plot. However, due to the methods utilized by Miria and the ordeal with Vaughn, she was relieved of her position of a Celestine elite and reduced to the rank of a line sister by Canoness Galatea. Following this event, she later accepted a post as part of a mission to reclaim the abandoned Adeptus Royatus Fortress Convent on Sanctuary 101, which had the misfortune of being the first to have contact with the marauding Necrons, who subsequently massacred all the battle sisters that were present. Her assistant Verity agreed to accompany Miria to help reconsecrate the convent. Temperance Blaze Temperance Blaze was the Canoness Superior in charge of all Adeptus Sororitas forces on Vigilus during the War of Beasts, 
She was known to possess a fiery temper and was so roundly feared by the powers that be on Vigilus that she was given free reign by the entire ruling Aquilarian Council to prosecute the Vigilus campaign as she saw fit. Beneath her was a network of trusted canonesses and Celestian superiors she had named the Sacred Thorns, each of whom she entrusted with the defense of the Ecclesiarch's interests in a different high straw. Temperance was so enraged by the assault upon her world, by foul Xenos scum, that in the early days of the war she did much of the fighting herself. Only as it became clear that the conflict would not be won by the Imperium quickly, and would drag on as a stalemate for quite some time did her wrath cool. She resumed her duties as war leader, and began to coordinate very closely with the elements of the Adeptus Astartes that came to Vigilus. End quote. Now I have left out some of the most important of the Order of Our Martyred Lady, as I intend to perform more expansive entries on them specifically in due course. I hope you will join me when they are released. I will be attempting to get more, um, voice assistance, as we all know how jarring it is when I attempt to perform a female voiced role. Not pretty. I have been Baltimore, your faithful servant. I hope you have enjoyed this brief introduction to the Order of Our Martyred Lady. If so, then please do consider liking and subscribing. If you do, then hit the notifications button, as I would not want you to miss out. If you see the worth in what we are doing, then do also consider joining our Patreon, or giving the video a share if that is beyond your present scope. It will be a great boon. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for... Fun. Tulu. And back to the story. They'd done it. We had done it. The vile things inside gave up practically no resistance. For the level of defence it had, and the fanaticism from its followers. Odd. When the canoness walked into its chamber, we watched as she did not stop, did not falter, did not slow. She just strode towards a husk on her throne, and as soon as she was in range, she pulled the trigger on her plasma pistol. And it died. The sting that its followers prayed to, lived for, died for. It just shone like a star as the plasma smashed into its face and melted it off in a nanosecond. And it was over. The things just all slumped down as if whatever had made them move was suddenly gone. They just stopped. So we walked amongst them and finished their miserable existences. Hours later, I was one of those tasked with checking. A grisly business usually, but I felt so calm. So at peace. We've done it. The Emperor had given us an enemy, and we had taken its head. Well, the sisters had, but I had been allowed to help. I was proud. And so I took that calm and energy and went out with the search parties to check the battlefield. On the approach was where they had fought hardest, for some reason. The tunnels were bad, but it was more like they were so desperate that they were just throwing themselves at us to try and to drown us in their bodies. But down here, we had to fight hardest. I won't lie, I found him in the most sad way. It was getting dark, I had walked for so long, I had lost track, and lost concentration. I was reliving the day, the way my angel moved, the way she slew those heathens. Everything about her. So I lost myself, and nearly missed him. I'm not proud to say that I stepped on his hand, but the effect was good, I guess. Because he moved it, and gave off a groan. I slipped in shock and landed in the mud and blood beside him, Half hidden under bodies, he was barely alive. As I pulled those piles off him, he gasped for air. He looked up at me after a few seconds. The last body gone, I looked at him too. Blood caked around his mouth, his chest half crushed still. I could see the pain in his eyes as he smiled and whispered, Smile for me. For some reason, I didn't just smile. I beamed at him. I turned him over and gave him a gulp of water. He took it 
and he looked up at me. What's your name, soldier? says I. And he whispered back, Josiah, but you can call me Josh.